everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Today I am going to talk to you about how I do my costume photography and I'm going to go over tips and tools both for taking pictures of yourself and also for taking pictures of other people, all with just your smartphone. I've been talking about making this video for quite some time as it was actually a class I was originally supposed to teach at Costume College in 2020, but well, we all know what happened there. So now that I finally had the chance to teach this class at this year's Costume College, I can at last share all of these tips and tricks with you all as well. So first off, if you follow me on Instagram, which is at Lady Rebecca Fashions, you will know that I share a ton of pictures of all of my costumes over there. And a whole lot of those pictures are ones that I've actually taken of myself. It's fantastic if you do have the opportunity to work with actual photographers, people who have great eyes and good equipment, but you can still take wonderful pictures even if you're just by yourself with your own smartphone. I think it's also super important to train up all costumers on some basic photography elements because that way if you're at a costume event and you hand your camera off to someone else you will still get good pictures of yourself and not blurry shots of you with poor lighting and bad camera angles. So in other words if you find this video helpful please do share it with all of your costuming friends or heck even your non-costuming friends so that you can help to ensure that all costumers can always get great pictures of their costumes. We spend all of this time, effort, and money on making our costumes, and I think it is so important to document that effort, whether or not you even use photo sharing apps like Instagram. So in this video we are going to cover several main topics. Camera angles, poses and body angles, lighting, backgrounds, and tools. Let's start with camera angles. First off, make sure that you never take pictures from below the subject. Taking a picture from too low will be much more unflattering. I would say that a good rule of thumb is to never have the camera below the subject's bust height, unless you are going for a power pose. A power pose can be pretty commonly used in cosplay photography, especially for superheroes and villains, since the lower angle makes the subject look larger and more powerful. If you are doing a power pose, you can kind of help this angle look a little bit more flattering by jutting out your chin, but it's still not going to be all that flattering for most people. The best angles are either straight on or from slightly above. Straight on works best if you are doing a full length shot of a costume. So again, you would want the camera to be at least at the height of the subject's bust or upper chest area. Taking pictures from slightly above is more flattering, but it works best for portraits or other closer cropped photos because if you hold the camera too high, you can easily warp a full length picture and make the subject's body look very out of proportion. And remember, all of this applies for self photography too. In fact, frankly, all of the tips that I'm going to be talking about in this video apply to self photography as well and it's really only that you need a few extra tools to be able to take pictures of yourself which I will talk about those tools later in the video. Of course while the angle of the camera is extremely important it's also good to remember to angle yourself especially if you have someone else behind the camera. I do want to give a little caveat here that most of my posing tips do relate to feminine historical costumes and princess type cosplays as that is what I have experience in but I feel like a lot of this can also be applied to more masculine poses or for other cosplays or other type of clothing as well. First, when you're posing you want to create space with your body. For example, you want to have your arms a little bit away from your sides. This is usually more flattering even if it can feel a little awkward at first. Creating this space can also help with my next tip which is, for historical costuming at least, you want to have soft hands but not limp limbs. Keeping tension in your limbs will give you a better body posture in your picture. That said, unless you are going for a more masculine or superhero pose, I don't recommend flexing or anything like that. It's just about subtle tension. I recommend studying historical portraiture and ballet dancers for good examples of this and also for some nice hand and arm gestures that you can use in your poses. I apologize if you hear any yard work sounds going forward as my neighbors landscapers are here with two lawnmowers. 
You may also want to figure out if you have a best side. You don't always have to stick with it, and it's entirely possible that you like all sides and angles of your face and your body. Personally, I find that I do usually have a best side, which is the left side of my face, so I tend to take a lot more pictures at this angle. I also prefer to angle my body just slightly, as I find that to be more flattering than straight on. Definitely try a couple of pictures at each angle or each side of your face, though, as even if you do decide that you have a best side, you never know what you might like best in any one costume or hairstyle until you actually go through all of the pictures afterwards. It's especially important to remember to take pictures of all sides of your body, since you want to show off all of the different parts of your costume. Get some side shots, some back shots, etc., and certain eras may also dictate which angles are best. For example, if you're wearing 18th century peignets, taking a shot straight on from both the front and the back, especially if you're wearing a robe à la française, are going to be the best for your silhouette, and a side profile will be basically pointless. But if you're wearing a bustle, a side profile shot is incredibly important to showcase the dress. And if you're wearing a train, don't forget to include it in the picture. You might want more shots of the back, in which case fluff your train out to its fullest, or you might want a slight diagonal angle with the train sort of wrapping around to the front of you if it's long enough. And if there are certain details of your costume that you're especially proud of, such as some awesome pattern matching or some gorgeous embroidery, make sure to get angles, especially close-up angles, that really capture those features. Remember, you're doing this on your phone, so you can really take as many pictures as you like and then just go through them later and decide which ones are best. One thing to keep in mind as you're angling yourself in relation to the camera is that things that are closer to the camera will look larger. So, for example, be careful to keep arm or leg movements parallel to the camera instead of perpendicular, or you may wind up with a very large hand in the frame. As far as face angles go, it's usually more flattering to have your chin up or out. This helps to avoid double chins. If you draw your shoulders down a bit, Although it will feel awkward, it can actually help to lengthen your neck and sort of pull your neck away from your chin. So it's especially helpful if you do find that you are prone to double chins in your pictures. Also, don't forget to smile. Yes, when you look at historical portraits or very old photographs, you don't see a lot of smiles. But as photography became faster, people started smiling more. So sure, take some that are serious, but make sure that you take some smiling. Please don't worry about what a smile might do to your face, like if you get lines or wrinkles when you smile, those lines and wrinkles just show that you're a joyful person. One thing that happens to me when I smile though is that my eyes tend to squinch up quite a bit. Since eyes are so important in photography, I do recommend that if this happens to you, you try to widen your eyes as you smile. Make sure you're pairing the wide eyes with a genuine smile though, or you can end up looking a little demonic. A great tip to try for a genuine smile is to laugh. Laughing will give you a great smile and put a twinkle in your eyes, so even if you're out taking pictures by yourself, it is so great to laugh as you smile. Okay, let's move on to one of the most important elements of photography, lighting. First off, there's two main kinds of lighting, such as natural lighting, which is what I use for most of my pictures, or artificial lighting, like what I'm using to record this video right now. And within those two main types, there are lots of subsets of lighting that I want to talk about. Natural lighting is light from the sun, so unless you live in a house with very large, well-placed windows, which I completely do not, this means outdoor photography. One type of natural lighting is direct lighting, such as standing in a sunny spot on a sunny day. It is very difficult to get good pictures in direct natural lighting as the bright sun can make the pictures look very harsh. However, you can get a very good artistic look if you can position yourself or your subject so that the light is just slightly behind them, like I did for the meadow pictures that I took when I shot my Kirsten Larson cosplay. It will give your subject a bit of a glow, and it means that your subject won't be squinting since they're not trying to look directly into the sun. Also, if the direct light can come down and bounce off of other surfaces, such as a shiny field or a body of water, then it can look very pretty as it bounces light back onto the subject. 
That said, if you are positioning the sun slightly behind the subject, you may have to go in and edit some portrait light onto the face afterwards because having light from behind does make the front of the subject a lot more shadowy. Another form of direct natural light is golden hour, which is at sunset when the sun is low in the sky and casts that orangey glow onto everything. Golden hour can lead to some beautiful pictures. So you may find that if you're at a popular photo spot at that time of day, you might have to work around other photographers as well. For golden hour, depending on the type of shot you're going for, you can either have the subject face into the sun or have the sun behind the subject. If the subject is facing into the sun, it will give them that beautiful golden glow, but please be careful with the subject's eyes. If you're behind the camera, count down to when you take the picture so they can just open their eyes right at the right moment. If you are taking pictures of yourself, open your eyes only for the quick photo and then close them or look away from the sun immediately. If the subject is framed by the light, you can get wonderfully moody silhouettes. I always like to try to do my spooky shoots at golden hour because it can create quite a haunting silhouette, even without any editing especially if you're working with different fabric textures such as shears. One note on golden hour though, it can be extremely difficult to shoot at golden hour if you're photographing yourself as you're basically shooting blind, both if you are facing into the light, in which case you can't see what you're doing, and having the light behind you because then lining yourself up will be very difficult. So if possible, I do recommend bringing a friend to help you. You do also have to be careful that your friend, or your tripod for that matter, doesn't cast a shadow onto you if you're facing into the sun. One other form of direct light would be dappled light, such as standing in a partially shaded area. Dappled light sucks. Try to avoid dappled light as much as possible unless you're going for something artistic because it will make parts of your picture bright and parts of it in shadow, meaning that it will also be very difficult to attempt to edit your lighting after the fact as well. Though, that said, if you are able to get your subject in even light, a background with dappled light on it can look very pretty. Indirect light, on the other hand, is your friend. Indirect light, such as an overcast day or a fully shaded area, is really lovely for photography because you get the same even amount of light coming from everywhere, and there's no strong light that will try to wash out your picture. Although you won't be able to do any cool light effects like you would at golden hour, it is so much easier to shoot on an overcast day than it is to shoot on a sunny one. Sometimes though, you might find that you have to or that you want to take photos indoors, in which case you will need artificial lighting. The regular lamps in your house are not going to do a good job here, so you will want to invest in one of the following types of lighting instead. Right now, when filming this, and all of my videos for that matter, I'm using a ring light. Ring lights can come in various sizes, but I recommend a large one on a tripod where you'll mount your phone to the center of the light. I think mine is 18 inches across. Ring lights are great for portraiture, especially since some of the new ones have a little dial on the light where you can actually adjust the warmth of the light as well. Mine, unfortunately, does not have that feature. That said, ring lights do have a rather small focus area of light, so they don't work the best for a full-length picture. They will also leave a reflection of the ring light in the subject's eyes, which some people like, but other people find distracting. Another option would be softbox lights. Softbox lights usually work in pairs, and they will diffuse light all over the subject area so that they're much better for full-length shots. You position one on either side of the subject so that there's an even amount of light coming from everywhere. The downside to softbox lights is that you do need the space to put them, and even though they do fold up so that you can more easily store them when you're not using them, that will add to your setup time and mean that you have at least three tripod type items stored in your closet, plus two very giant and often very fragile light bulbs. I've linked my favorite softboxes and the ring light that I want to upgrade to down in the description below if you're looking for some, as well as all of the other tools that I'll be mentioning later in this video. One other artificial light source that a lot of people don't know about is that most phones nowadays actually have a built-in selfie portrait light. Whenever I'm doing self photography, I always use the selfie camera so that I can see what I'm doing. On most newer phones, you're going to almost always get just as good of a picture with the selfie camera as you are with the rear-facing camera, 
though actually you will see one exception to that rule next week with my fiber optic dress, since it turns out that selfie camera really can't capture fiber optic light. Who knew? How to access the selfie portrait light is going to be different on all phones, so you may have to look up how to get it, but on a Google Pixel, which is what I have, this is how you turn it on. First, open your camera app, turn the camera around to selfie mode, press the little gear icon in the upper left hand corner, and then press the little light bulb icon. The selfie light will provide some limited light that's great for a portrait crop since that's basically what a selfie is anyway, but it won't throw light very far, so it's unfortunately not enough light for a full body shot. You can use the selfie light in combination with outdoor photography too, like if you're in a more shaded area. I think that about covers lighting, so let's quickly talk about the background of your photos. If you're shooting inside, you will want a neutral background. Blank walls can often reflect light, so I recommend hanging a curtain, not a shiny curtain, as a background. I have a curtain rail set up behind me here so that I can pull the curtain, mine are velvet, over my fashion plates to have a neutral background. In fact, it's actually a double curtain rod so that at some point I can hang a different colored curtain or different textured curtain up as well for a different look. When I close these all the way, I will just stick a little straight pin right in the center here to keep them closed, otherwise they don't quite want to stay closed on their own. If you can get a curtain or fabric that extends out onto the floor, that's even better since then you won't get that harsh line where the curtain ends and the carpeting or flooring starts. For outdoor photography, you have far more options. You pretty much just want to make sure that your background is not too distracting. and not the exact color that you're wearing. <laughs> Look out for things like modern boats, trash cans, cars, random posts, people, etc. There are apps that can help you remove these things, or you can just Photoshop them out, but it's easiest to just not have them there in the first place. Personally, I like to find places to shoot that A, have good lighting, and B, have backgrounds that might fit a certain theme of the outfit. I live in the Pacific Northwest, so there's really not many historical buildings here and nothing that dates to before the late Victorian period, so I tend to shoot most often in nature. As an example, recent shoots that I've done have included my Samantha Mitty dress, where I went to a waterfront park that I knew would have potential for golden hour, and I also knew had buildings that dated to Samantha's time. To find this park, I went on Google Maps and I looked down the coastline for waterfront parks near me. Once you click on a location on Google Maps, it will show you other people's photos of that location, so you can get a little idea of what you might see there, what lighting might be like, etc. I also recently shot my Kirsten cosplay at a park that I've used several times, which has a large grassy meadow, which I thought would work really well for those Midwest vibes. As these meadow shots were in full sun though, I wound up shooting almost completely blind, so it was pretty much just luck that I got such a great picture out of it. Let's talk about the other tools that you're going to want for self-photography. If you're taking pictures of other people outside, you just need your smartphone. But if you're shooting by yourself, these are the tools I recommend, all of which are linked in the Amazon list down below in the description. You will want to have a small Bluetooth remote. I'm pretty sure that any small Bluetooth camera remote should work for any type of phone, and I recommend having at least a couple of these as they are very easy to lose. They work great with your camera's phone app, which is what I always use for my pictures, though I do have to say a caveat, the one time that I tried to directly record a reel into Instagram, I found that the remote wouldn't actually start the camera when I was within the Instagram app. I've also noticed that some of these remotes have better connection than others when holding them behind your back or in a pocket, so it's another good reason to have multiple remotes. You will absolutely need a tripod for self-photography. I have the Amazon Basics tripod and it works great. It can go just about tall enough for me, I'm 5'10", so while I can't get a shot on it from above my head, at least not when I'm using my horizontal layout filming camera that I'm filming this on, I can do head-on shots just fine. And I can just squeak out a shot from a little bit above on my phone since the camera is on the top of the phone. I like the way that you can angle the camera on this tripod and the legs also shrink down really easily if you're doing shots while seated. 
You will also need something to connect your phone to your tripod. I've tried a few different phone holders at this point, and the one that I've linked, this one, is my favorite. I like this one because most of the others seem to be spring-loaded, whereas this one just has a knob to tighten the clamp. I found that with the spring-loaded ones, A, it can be hard to get your phone in and out, and they can also easily wind up activating buttons on the side of your phone. This one also pivots horizontally, so you can get portrait shots or landscape shots with it too. Any sort of these phone holders will screw into the little post that clips into your tripod. This clicks in and out of the tripod with a little lever. You may also want to try a few different editing apps on your phone. The only one that I use besides the one that came with my phone is called Snapseed. With Snapseed, you can remove minor imperfections in the background or blemishes, etc. though it can be a little challenging to do that, but I find that Snapseed is really great at enhancing the lighting. There are various portrait modes, black and white tones, etc. but my favorite effect is simply to go into vignette, put a very slight vignette on, and then turn up the focal light a fair amount on the face. If you have any photo editing apps you love though, especially if they're free, please do let me know what they are. And with that, I think you're ready to go out and try some costume photography. I would love to know if these tips have been helpful for you, and if you have any additional tips, please do leave them down below in the comments so that we can all learn from you. And if you go out and do a photo shoot using these tips, please do tag me on Instagram so that I can see your pictures. If you like this video though, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon, and if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other random costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below, or you can send me a super thanks right here on YouTube. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon and Mirage. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing! And if you heard any meowing or jingling or any other noises besides potential lawnmower noises in this video, it's because this little girl has been needing attention the entire video. Oh, she's going to eat my earring. What are you doing? You know? What is it? You goose. You need to go Hey, don't bite me. Don't bite me. Say hi to your adoring fans. Careful. Where are you going? <laughs> Say bye, Dora. Say bye. Bye, everyone. Of course, while the angle of the camera is extremely important, excuse you, I'm talking. <laughs>